Would you take the Word of God and turn with me to, in your Bibles, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians and uh, chapter 8. <clears throat> Paul is uh, continuing here to address evidently some issues that had been written to him. Back in chapter 7, verse 1, he had said, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me. So Paul is spending some time to address the issues, the topics. In chapter 7, he dealt with uh, the topic of uh, marriage, of uh, celibacy. He even dealt with um, uh, someone who became a believer whose spouse remained an unbeliever. And, and how are you to look at that specific issue? And uh, he talked about fathers also giving away their daughters in marriage. Uh, during a time of distress, whether they should do so or refrain from doing so. And so uh, Paul encouraged those believers in chapter 7 to uh, consider some principles that are to guide their lives. And those principles rise above those individual topics. As, as we saw, uh, those principles can be applied in uh, more areas than those specific topics that are mentioned. And so these principles are helpful in equipping those believers to, to be sound in their judgment. And that's what we want to be. You know, sometimes we make decisions and uh, we have to be sound in our judgment. And, and how, how are we able to make the right judgment? It's going to be based upon the, the principles that guide our lives. And um, uh, Paul, Paul in chapter 8 now shifts to another matter that evidently had been written to him uh, because as you look at chapter 8, verse 1, he says, Now as touching things offered to idols. So notice he says, now as touching things, meaning that uh, it seems that this was also written to him, that uh, this topic about eating meat offered to idols was written to him. And so he is going to reply to this and deal with this other issue in chapter 8. And that issue is going to run through the next few chapters uh, as well. And he's going to deal with other things. Now, uh, the eating of meats offered to idols is the subject of uh, chapter 8. And as we find in our text, Paul is concern, his, Paul's concern is beyond the subject of meat itself. Uh, Paul gives these believers some, again, some principles that they all should live by, whether they have chosen to eat the meat or to abstain from eating the meat. And he wants them to rise above that and to think on a higher level, okay? As Christians, we ought to think on a higher level than the world thinks. And uh, we're going to see in this chapter how this will apply to us. But let, let's read together. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1, out of uh, respect and reverence for the Word of God. Notice with me 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing as yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered to, uh, in, in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many, and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit, there is not in every man that knowledge. <clears throat> For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened 
to eat those things which are offered to idols. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. I'd like to bring your attention. Verse 1, the end of the verse says, Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Verse 11 says, And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. <coughs> but when ye sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. I'd like to preach a message that I've entitled this morning, When Knowledge Becomes a Sin Against Christ. When Knowledge Becomes a Sin Against Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word, and I pray that you would Help us to understand the principle that Paul is trying to communicate that rises above the single issue of eating meat offered to idols. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to live by this principle, uh, that uh, we understand how uh, knowledge is to be married with charity, and that if it is not, it can very easily become sinful. So Lord, give us understanding and help us to apply this in our lives as we face issues ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'd like to begin by laying out the issue that these believers at Corinth were dealing with before we come to the principle that he establishes in the first three verses. Uh, we need a reminder uh, of the, the general spirit that prevailed in the church at Corinth. Uh, because there was, as we saw in chapter 1, 2, and 3, there was, remember, contention in the church. Uh, there was strife and there was divisions. A and Paul confronted them with a strong statement. Remember back in chapter 3 and verse 1, he told these Christians, he says, Ye are yet carnal. And he says, and the reason why I know you're carnal is because there is envy and uh, strife and division. And so that's a sign of their carnality. And so the carnality of these believers uh, is really an important backdrop as we come to chapter 8, even chapter 7, because the issue at hand is um, the eating or the not eating of meats offered to idols. Should a believer eat meat offered to idols or should a believer refrain himself from eating meat offered to idols? And uh, for that, we have to consider it no, knowing that there's already division in the church. Not over this, but generally speaking. There's contention, envy, strife, divisions. And now there's this issue of whether they should eat or should not eat meat offered to idols. So we have to know the cultural background at, at Corinth. Remember, Corinth, like many other cities of uh, Macedonia and Achaia, by the way, he had just come from Athens. In Athens, there was gods everywhere. It, it was said of Athens that there were more gods than people. And, and as you, he goes westward to Corinth, it's, there's it's just pagan temples everywhere. Um, really, Macedonia and Achaia was filled with paganism, not just because of the Greek culture that had persisted, but the Romans, when they conquered uh, the, the Greek, uh, the Grecian Empire, uh, they brought their own gods, and the Greeks had their gods, and the Romans had their gods, and you come into Corinth, and there's Greek gods, and Roman gods, and uh, there's chaos everywhere. And so there were many gods and many temples built in honor of those gods. For example, the temple of Apollo was built long before ever, uh, Paul ever came to Corinth, some five to seven hundred years before he ever came to Corinth. Uh, the goddess uh, Aphrodite was the protector deity of the city of Corinth. Uh, there were at least three sanctuaries located in the city of Corinth uh, dedicated to Aphrodite. It was the custom of the people who worshipped those uh, many false gods to offer animal sacrifices. Uh, if we know the Old Testament, that's also a backdrop, knowing that there are also Jews in Corinth. 
Uh, but we know the Old Testament. We understand that the sacrificial system, and we've been studying through that on Sunday night, uh, was instituted at the tabernacle. The people would bring their animal sacrificed. If it was a lamb, it was the best that they had. Uh, the priest would offer the sacrifice. They would burn certain parts of the sacrifice. The meat that remained, they were partakers, themselves the priest, of that meat. But if anything that was dedicated to God was not eaten of the priest, the rest was burnt off. Um, the remains of the meat that was not eaten by the priest was never sold to anyone else. Now, the pagan system was a little different at Corinth. Uh, people would bring, in the same fashion, their best animals to be sacrificed. The priests of those uh, pagan temples would offer certain portions of the sacrifice. Uh, they would burn them, and while other portions would, 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 was, were reserved for them to eat, and any remaining meat was brought to the markets, meat markets outside of the temple to be sold. Uh, Paul refers to this market in chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 25, as the shambles. And the word shambles literally means meat market. And so the people would be eager to purchase meat offered to idols because, because it was always the best meat, right? The people who would bring their sac animal sacrifice would always bring the best lamb from their flock. They would always bring the uh, best animals. And so the meat that was offered, that was sold in the shambles was considered, if you want the best meat, go to the shambles. The problem with the shambles is that meat was often offered to idols or another portion of that meat had been offered to idols. Now, if they ate meat offered to idols, were they participating in idolatry? Were, were they participating in the whole pagan system of Corinth? Well, evidently, there, were some, there was some uh, level of uncertainty about what to do since they had written Paul about, to, to Paul about it, and Paul's familiar of, uh, of Corinth. Uh, there were most likely in the church differences of opinion in the church, and no doubt this was probably the source of another uh, a reason for division and contention and strife in the church. And so Paul already established that uh, the contention and division was already going on in the church. So what were they to do? So here Paul establishes an important principle to help these believers uh, expand their thinking beyond the single issue of uh, meat offered to idols. And the reason why he wants them to go beyond this single issue is because in the next chapter, he brings other things to light that have nothing to do with meat, but he takes the same principle of chapter 8 and applies it to other things. And so there's something deeper going on that Paul is trying to address. Paul deals with their hearts and really their spirit on the matter. Not just the issue of meat, but what is their spirit on this issue. So the chapter unfolds in the following way. I'll give you a summary of the chapter 8, and then we'll deal with the details. Paul first establishes the principle. Then he proceeds to tell them that their knowledge about idols was technically correct. And I use the word technically purposefully. They were technically correct. And then he turns their attention to those people and those brethren in the church whose conscience is still sensitive to idols. And he wants those who have that knowledge to think about those other people. And uh, finally, he comes back to the principle that he first established and he works it out. Uh, showing them how knowledge itself can become sin against Christ. Now, that gets my attention. I don't know about you. That gets my attention. That my knowledge and the way I hold to my knowledge can actually be a sin against Christ. That's a pretty strong rebuke from Paul. So let's look, first of all, 
as to how Paul establishes this principle. So in verse 1, he, he says, Now, as, as such in th uh, things offered to idols, here's the, the issue at hand. Here's what you've written to me about. Uh, he says, uh, we know that we all have knowledge. And I think here, he, he says, now, <coughs> there's a lot of people who claim to have knowledge about this, who uh, say, hey, here's what we know about idols. Here's what we know about meat offered to idols. And uh, others would have a, a different knowledge, but we all have knowledge. He, he says, though, here's the principle. And he puts it in a contrast. He says, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Now think about those two things. There are two important truths that form this principle. Okay? In other words, here Paul, he's going to work out this principle in this chapter. But he's going to establish two things that are true in order to work out this principle. The first thing, here's truth number one. Okay? This is reality. Knowledge puffeth up. That's truth number one. Uh, now, this is simply a statement of reality. The word here, when he says knowledge puffeth up, uh, I, I always think puffer fish, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, but the, the idea means to be literally inflated. That's what the word puff means, to be inflated. And to be inflated means to become proud. And so he says here, knowledge itself, here's the reality about knowledge. It has a natural tendency to make one proud. That's just a reality. That's just a truthful statement. Okay, so that's truth one. Knowledge puffeth up. Here's truth number two. Charity edifieth. Now, the word edifieth means to, to build up. Uh, the word charity uh, is a strong word for love. Specifically, that word that is used here is agape love, which is the highest form of love, which is divine love, the love that God demonstrated for us. <coughs> Romans 5.8. God commendeth his love, agape love, toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, and here's that type of love. Uh, Jesus died for us. Here's how he loved us. Not, he didn't die for us because we were good and because we were righteous. He died for us while we were completely unworthy and unacceptable to him. And so that's why he sent his son. That's agape love. That's what charity does. Charity edifieth. So, uh, love is, um, in contrast to knowledge puffeth up, where someone becomes proud and prideful, love is not concerned about having personal advantage over another. That's not what love is concerned with. Love is primarily concerned with edifying and building up others. Now, the New Testament, don't misunderstand, the New Testament repeatedly exhorts the believer to grow in their knowledge of Jesus Christ. Knowledge is important, but knowledge in and of itself is insufficient. Uh, there must be another element that is present with knowledge. Without this other element present, Knowledge actually can do more harm than good. Uh, you see, the, the, the other element here in our text is called charity. Now, those are the two truthful statements. Knowledge puffeth up, charity edifieth. Now he says, all right, let's, let's, we're going we're gonna to work this out through this chapter. Uh, notice verse 2. If any man think that he knoweth anything. Now, let me uh, uh, raise up your hand. How many of you know something? Would you raise your hand? That should be everybody, all right? And now this is not private, but you know something, right? You, uh, you, you know something. Um, here he says, if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. He doesn't say you don't know anything. He says you're finite. You, you don't know everything. You don't know things as you ought to know. I grant it, you know something. You, you know anything. You, there are many things you can know. But you have to concede that you don't know everything as you ought to know. 
That's a big concession. If knowledge puffeth up, it works against that spirit, doesn't it? That you don't know everything. You see, the problem here is not knowledge. Don't misunderstand. We have to have knowledge. That's important. But the, the problem is not knowledge. Rather, it is how one thinks about his own knowledge. Do you notice what he says verse 2? If any man think that he knoweth anything. You see, the problem here is not knowledge itself. Rather, it is how one thinks about his knowledge, how one thinks about himself. Uh, we are all fallible. Only God is infallible. We need to have the wisdom to say that our knowledge is limited. That's wisdom, by the way. If a man thinks of himself as having knowledge on any topic, on any issue, and that his knowledge is perfect and final, he does not possess uh, knowledge that is actually able to benefit others. <coughs> you see, our opinion about our own knowledge can actually become a destructive force, not a constructive force. Notice what he says there. He, 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 he's still talking about this principle, but verse 3, he says, If any man love God, so he confronts knowledge puffeth up, hear how it puffs up because of how you think about yourself and your own knowledge. But you have to recognize you, don't not, you know nothing as you ought to know. But then he turns to love. He says, Now, if any man love God, the same is known of him. Now, Paul does not say here that, there, that they must begin with loving their brethren. Right? That's not what he says. He begins with a love for God. You see, the man who loves God, he says, so if any man love God, by the way, if you love God, that's what enables you to love your fellow man. Uh, the same is known of him. Notice, the man who loves God is known of God. <laughs> he does not say that the man who loves God has true knowledge. He says that the man who loves God is known of God. Now put that in contrast with verse 2. A man who thinks of his own knowledge, how he thinks of, about his own knowledge. Here's what he is saying. God's knowledge about me ought to be more important than my own thoughts about my own knowledge. Here's the truth. God knows the reality about me. And God knows when I act out something, if I do it, I love for Him. He knows that. So, now, with those things in mind, he, that's the principle. Here's the principle for us. Knowledge must be yoked up with love for its proper exercise and its benefit to others. Uh, without charity, knowledge is inadequate and ineffective. Okay, now, a man who is puffed up by his own knowledge will have great difficulty in truly being impactful and useful in the life of others. But a man who edifies when moved by charity for God or love for God will have great success in truly being impactful and useful in the life of others. There seems to be uh, much knowledge today, but very little wisdom. Uh, by the way, Proverbs 15.2 says, The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. Here's what he says. You have knowledge? That's good. That does not make you wise. A wise person is someone who uses knowledge the right way. So let's separate in our minds wisdom and knowledge. They're two different things. Wisdom uses knowledge the right way. The fool uses knowledge the wrong way. Okay? So, uh, by the way, it's in James chapter 3. I mentioned this on Wednesday night. James 3.13. Who is a wise man among you and endued with knowledge among you? Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge? You have knowledge? Who is the wise man? Here's what he says. If you have knowledge, that's good. You may have a person here who has knowledge and another person here who has knowledge. But you don't know who is wise. Who is the wise person? Well, he says, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him, the wise man, 
show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Did you catch that? The man who has received knowledge is not instructed to show his knowledge. He is instructed to show good behavior with meekness. That's the wisdom that we have to possess. And so he says, hey, who is the wise man? An endued with knowledge among you. Let him pour out his knowledge. That's not what he says. He says, the wise man is a meek man. You see that? Don't think that you're wise because you have knowledge. Those are two different things. So he establishes this principle. Okay, with those two truths, knowledge puffeth up, charity edifieth. The problem is not knowledge, but how you use knowledge. And if knowledge is married with charity. But then Paul proceeds to tell them that, uh, to tell them that their knowledge about idols is correct. Notice in verse 4, he says, As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered to, in sacrifice to idols, notice, we know. So here he deals with, here's what we know. And Paul says here, he includes himself, I have this knowledge too. We know certain things, notice. Um, uh, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. Uh, for though there be that are called gods, the, whether in heaven or in earth, uh, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the, the, us who know, there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and uh, one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. So here's what we know. So their knowledge was twofold. Notice, first, they knew the truth about idols. What's that truth? Well, uh, Paul declared what they knew. They knew that an idol was no God at all. It was not real. Those who would offer sacrifices were offering sacrifices to gods that were not real. Uh, since there are no gods but one, uh, the meat itself that was offered to idols can affect anything because they're not true. So he says, first, we know the truth about idols. But then there's a second part of what they know is they knew the truth about the one true God. Right? He says, uh, we know that there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. So notice he says, one God, Father, and Son. So we know Jesus is God. Amen? Amen. Uh, we affirm the deity of Jesus Christ. Uh, th there's, a, there's another reference uh, to clearly establish the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, the truth and knowledge... This truth and knowledge that there is only one God who is established. I won't go there for sake of time, but you could read Isaiah 44. The whole chapter is about God saying, uh, is there any out, uh, anyone else but me? I know not any. <laughs> and, and so uh, God says, look, there is no other God. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 sa says, <clears throat> Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Uh, the Lord is, God, there's one God and one Lord. That's it. And so Paul establishes their knowledge about idols and the one true God. And he says, you are correct. He says, we know these things. We know the, these things about idols. We know that meat offered to idols is nothing. And, and, and we know that there is only one God. So we know those things. Okay? Remember, the trouble is not knowledge. It's how you hold knowledge. So then now Paul turns their attention to those brethren whose consciences is still sensitive to idols. Notice verse 7, he says, Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. And so he says there are those who are still sensitive towards those idols. They directly associate the meat offered to idols with the whole pagan system. And to them, the meat surplus that finds its way to the shambles is tainted by its association with the pagan temple and the idols. And so those who have knowledge that an idol is nothing in the world should give consideration that not every man understand, uh, has that knowledge, 
or uh, has lost all sensitivities to the pagan system. And so he, he goes on to work it out. So do you notice this? You have that knowledge. You are correct. But you need to take consideration of others. Now, uh, he deals later, later with, with, he deals specifically with brother, bro, brethren, those who are in the church. Here when he refers to uh, there is not in every man that knowledge. I don't think necessarily he's talking about uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. But he says, but what if, what if you think an idol is nothing, but here you are eating and somebody invites you to the temple. Are they going to think that your actions is validating their gods? They, they think those gods are real. You know they're not real. But to them, here you are participating with them. And it could be that you're worshiping the one true God, but your actions communicate to them that you are approving of their pagan actions. So you, you have to take consideration, not just of yourself. In other words, you could dismiss it, well, I'm going to eat the best meat because that's the meat offered to idols, and so I'm going to participate. I know an idol is nothing, so it's no big deal. I have that knowledge. And what Paul is saying is you have to rise above that, and you have to think about uh, not just your knowledge, but you have to think about your behavior and how your behavior impacts others. Here's what you have to do, Christian. We have to deny ourselves for a greater cause. Now, Paul comes back to this principle showing how violating this principle is, can be a sin against Christ. He says in verse 8, uh, But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither we, if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. So the knowledgeable believer would think, well, I can eat the meat. It's nothing. An idol is nothing. That knowledge, he says, does not make you better. The weak believer maybe uh, thinks that there are some things that we cannot eat, specifically meat offered to idols, and he says, if you don't eat, you are not worse for thinking that. So, if you have that knowledge, you're not better. If uh, you don't eat, you're not worse. Whether you eat or whether you abstain, that doesn't commend you to God. That doesn't, God doesn't approve you on the basis of whether you eat the meat offered to idols or you don't eat the meat offered to idols. That's not uh, our approval before God. Okay? So, uh, you know, we might take, uh, let me take the, the example of, of fasting. By the way, uh, the, here is an area of, uh, of Christian liberty. We have to be careful not to uh, apply this to areas that doesn't apply. You know, some people have said, well, well that, that applies, you could apply this to, to alcohol, right? You can... Some people think it's right. Some people think it's not right. I think there's clear truth in the Bible th uh, telling us that we shouldn't drink at all. Okay? So sometimes people bring in that subject. That's, I don't think that's the right application. Uh, let me give you maybe uh, an application. Take the example of fasting. You totally not eat. If one Christian decides to fast for a period of time and abstain from eating any food, he is not better than his fellow believer for doing that. If another Christian at the very same time eats as he usually eats, he is not the worse for not fasting. Fasting does not approve, make someone, commend someone to God and another not be commended to God. Uh, in other words, there's a, there's a personal a choice and liberty in that. In, in verse 9 he says, But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So you can eat, that's okay. You can say, I'm not going to eat. That's also okay. But think about your impact. Think about the idea of you becoming a stumbling block. Do you have liberty to eat and not eat? Yes, you have the liberty to do both. But you should never use your liberty as a stumbling block to them that are weak. Here's a, Does a Christian have liberty? Yes, he has liberty. However, this liberty is never to be used as a stumbling block, so we have to think about what I'm doing. Is it being a stumbling block? The word stumbling block here is used in the sense that a believer may become careless by his example that he might end up being harmful to someone else. By the way, it might not even be purposeful, but nonetheless, he is. And so he says in verse 10, 
For if any man see thee which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple. So in other words, if you say, oh, idols are nothing, meat offered to idols is nothing, but you actually go to the very temple and participate, and you have that knowledge that those idols are nothing, and you know the one true and living God, but you go to the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? Uh, you could refer to, uh, well, somebody maybe that came from that pagan system. And you're in church, and you're coming together in church, worship the Lord. And after the church uh, meeting, uh, you talk together and say, hey, what would you do this week? So, well, I, I, uh, I was invited by my friends to go to the, to the, uh, to the temple of, uh, of Apollo. And we ate the meat there. It was good meat. And the other believer just came from that pagan system. And he completely forsook that pagan system. There was, this, there was a, a sensitivity in his life to that practice. And he says, that, that's strange. The association is, is strange. But the Christian who has knowledge says, ah, come on. Idols are nothing. They're not real. I just want to eat meat. That's all I'm interested in. That's the problem. You see? You're interested in yourself. He says, verse 11, And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat made my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. <clears throat> Do you see here what Paul goes to the extreme? He says, here is my concern for my fellow believer. As long as the world goes on, I will make the decision not to eat meat if I know it offends my brother. Even though I have the liberty to do so. Why? Because I, Paul says, I am more interested in edifying my brother than my thoughts about my own knowledge and being right. So, <clears throat> love, charity, is what edifies. You see, love must come in in a sense, along with knowledge, and love must be a corrective force, or we might say a balancing force with knowledge. Okay, so here's, is knowledge sinful? No. Is eating meat sinful? The act of eating meat sinful? No. But... The one who has knowledge, who participates knowing that his brother is still sensitive to idols and that offends him, and he has that knowledge, and he's more interested in being right, and as a result, he, is, he becomes a stumbling block. He causes an offense to his brother. And so Paul says, I had rather deny myself so that my brother can be built up. I'm more interested, I'm more interested in building my brother up than being right. Is that our spirit today? Now, <clears throat> uh, th this is very helpful because we are Bible believers. Amen? Amen. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. We believe Jesus Christ is the only way. There is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the, and the life. And we're pretty categoric about that. And we have knowledge about that. But let me ask you this. How is it that we hold the knowledge we have? In what is the, the spirit in which we hold the knowledge we have? You see, Paul is saying right off the bat, knowledge puffeth up. It is the natural tendency of what knowledge will do in your life. It will make you proud. And when you become proud, you start not caring about others. And so what you need to, to do is you need to love God. 
You see, don't let, by the way, the church at Colossae, one of the problems is their knowledge became a substitute for God. They gloried in all that they knew, and the whole time they were missing God. Paul reproved the church at Colossae for that. So, knowledge becomes a sin against Christ when the following happens. Okay? So here's the principle. Let me work it out based on the text. <clears throat> knowledge becomes a sin against Christ when the following happens. Number one, when knowledge stands alone, it causes someone to be proud. By the way, pride is a sin against God. First thing mentioned in the list of the seven things that God hates. Pride is the first one. So when knowledge stands alone, it causes a man to become proud. Number two, pride is evident by how one thinks about his own knowledge. Okay, in other words, there has to be enough wisdom in us to say, I don't know everything as I ought to know. But I'm the pastor of First Day Baptist Church. I don't know everything as I ought to know. So, well, you shouldn't be the pastor. No, I shouldn't be the pastor if I think I know everything. Only God knows everything. And so pride is evident by how one thinks about his own knowledge. Number three, pride is concerned with self and does not take into account the benefit of others. That's what pride always does. Uh, number four, prideful knowledge works itself out when it does not take into account the experiences of others. Well, I know they come from the, the temple of Apollo and they've used to eat meat and now they uh, think that they shouldn't eat meat because they, there's kind of this, uh, they still have the conscience of idols and so, uh, well, they're, they're wrong. Technically, but are you so proud that you will not take into account their past experience? Lastly, knowledge. Knowledge that is devoid of love produces a spirit that is sinful. Knowledge that is devoid of love produces a spirit that is sinful. He says this. Verse 12. Well, read verse 11 and 12 in combination. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wow, that is a strong rebuke. So you see knowledge that is devoid of love, charity, edifies. It produces a spirit that is sinful. <clears throat> so the question is, what is our... What is our, we receive knowledge, we're in church, we, we get preaching all the time. That's good, be in church, okay, get, get knowledge, all that you can. But watch how it affects you. What is our goal? Is our goal, is our goal um, a strong desire to pass on our knowledge? Or is our goal edification? There's a difference. There's a difference. Um, growing up in, in church, sometimes you, you hear preachers and you hear sometimes... <clears throat> uh, by the way, I, I don't, want, don't want to go the, the, the other hand, uh, the, all the way to the other end. Knowledge doesn't matter. All that matters is love. <laughs> That's foolishness too. I, I hope we understand that. Right? All that matters is we love each other. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. Absolutely not. Uh, but we can't, op the point is, we cannot operate with bo without both. And they must both be present. But in churches like ours, you know what the problem often is? It's not knowledge. It's charity. That, that's, that's how I perceive. Growing up in church, my entire, being in church my entire life. That's how I, that's the evidence that I've seen. Because of the emphasis, maybe. You know, we preach, we teach the Word of God, and we should. But that should always be married with charity.
because charity is what edifies. Knowledge puffs up. And so I, uh, I hope that God would not look at First State Baptist Church and say, wow, look at all these proud people with all the knowledge they have. I'd much rather God say, well, they're learning. They don't have all knowledge, but they sure do have charity. And that makes their knowledge more effective. See, it's better for us to have a little bit of knowledge with charity mm -hmm. than to have a lot of knowledge with no charity. A lot of knowledge, no charity, destructive. Little knowledge with an equivalent of charity, edification. So what is it that we want? What is it that we want? Let's ask the Lord to help us.